Good evening, and thanks for joining us tonight for our program, Amtrak in the Early Days. The DC chapter of the National Railway Historical Society presents free public programs on the third Friday of every month to further our mission, to expand the public appreciation of railroads and their history. I'm Scarlett Work, Program Coordinator for DC NRHS, and I'm happy you can join us tonight. A few words of introduction before we get started for those of you who may not be familiar with our organization. We have a number of different activities, some of which you may know of. Most famously, we own and operate a restored Pullman car at the Dover Harbor, as well as the Collinsville Inn and Franklin Inn, both bud coaches. We have a railroad library in Huntington Tower in Bowie, Maryland. We sponsor scholarships to rail camp, and we publish a monthly newsletter, The Timetable, that has railroad topics and information. So if you're new to DC and RHS, we'd love to have you as a member. Our program tonight is Amtrak in the Early Days, presented by Mr. Ira Silverman, whose career spans the years from historic passenger rail into the Amtrak era. Mr. Silverman has worn and continues to wear many hats in the rail community. He began his professional career at Illinois Central Railroad, where he worked as a financial analyst and assistant to the senior vice president for operations. He continued at Amtrak as a manager of operations planning and equipment, route manager for Eastern Routes, and director of route marketing. In 95, he became the chief transportation officer and manager of transit strategy for MARC, which is Maryland's commuter rail. And if you didn't know any of that, you may know him as a railroad traveler and enthusiast with an interest in railroad dining and menus, and as a talented railroad photographer. We recently celebrated Amtrak's 50th anniversary with fresh energy and enthusiasm as travel resumes and talk uh, springs up everywhere of new routes all around the country. But it's also a little bittersweet as we remember all that's lost from the earlier eras. Tonight, Ira will take us back with him to that critical juncture of railroad history with his experience and his extraordinary photographs documenting the trains and equipment of that transitional time. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ira Silverman. Over to you, Ira. Thank you. This picture sort of incorporates two things. That's me probably in 1971 or 72 when I was working for the Illinois Central Railroad, but in Amtrak's early uh, uh, period, they insisted that the railroads paint uh, their office cars in uh, Amtrak colors or they would not be able to be handled on Amtrak trains. So that in back of me is the um, uh, IC office car number one on the rear of the Panama Limited, and that's me too many years ago to remember. I was originally going to do just Amtrak, but adding the, the, the trains before Amtrak, I think makes it a lot more interesting. And so it's 10 years before and after. Uh, 10 years, the slides I'm pretty sure are not, uh, are all within that 10 year period. There might be a few in the Amtrak section, which are really after 1981 and the sharp people will see that, but you'll just pretend not to see it. Okay, where's Waldo? As Scarlett said, uh, I originally lived in New York uh, and um, in Queens. I worked one summer for the Long Island Railroad selling tickets, and I went to undergraduate at NYU. 1968 and through 70, I was at the Transportation Center at Northwestern University and then worked for the Illinois Central Railroad. Um, and then finally, as was mentioned, 75, I I went to Amtrak, stayed there till 1995, and then went to Mark, but most of the pictures will not go into that era. Um, the interesting thing about this is that when I was at Amtrak, there were three gentlemen who were senior uh, management officers, and their names were Alan Boyd, Paul Reistrup, and Dave Gunn, all to be future Amtrak presidents, and this was before there was Amtrak. In fact, on the last day of regular operation, April, what would that be, 30th uh, of 1971, I was in Central Station and I was stand, standing next to Alan Boyd. And uh, I, I guess I couldn't bear to go on, on a train that day. The IC did it right. They put uh, shrimp cocktail on the 
lounge car of the Panama Limited. Of course, it was all gone by Homewood. But I said to, to Boyd, you know, oh, I knew I had done some work for, I said, it's a sad day. And he said, but with young men like you, passenger trains will have a turnaround and, and come back or something like that. Well, I sort of dismissed that as, as typical Alan Boyd, uh, diplomatic uh, um, stuff. But he turned out to be right for me and he didn't even know right for him. Uh, and when I was at Amtrak, I, I left, I went to Amtrak when Paul Reistrup was president. That's how I got there. Then Alan Boyd was president. I was not there when Dave Dunn was president. I start this off, this is the, right before the end of, you know, private trains. The Penzi made one more shot at promoting the Broadway Limited. And there were four ads. I only have one here, but this is my favorite. It says the Broadway Limited of Chicago is in a wing jet, a jump jet, a speed jet, or a jet jet. It's called the train. And then the other great line in there is, um, uh, where is it? Uh, it takes the Broadway Limited a whole night to get to Chicago, but that's not its only advantage. They were great ads. Unfortunately, not great enough, and Amtrak resulted. Uh, this is probably in the mid 60s uh, in Penn Station where I used to haunt. Uh, in fact, there's an article, I don't forget what year it is, in Classic Trains Magazine about uh, my playground Penn Station. But here's a conductor at the bottom of the steps, you can see the directory to the cars front and rear. And I think there are nine sleepers there. So it was a pretty healthy looking train. Uh, there's the observation car, either the mountain view or the tower view. You note the blue flag sitting on the coupler pocket. And here we are in Chicago. I suspect this is the Penn Central. Uh, well, maybe, maybe it was still the Pennsylvania um, Broadway. I can't tell. No, it's Penn Central. I'm looking at the paint on some of the cars in the back. But still a pretty impressive looking train. Uh, not, all, uh, not all sleepers but predominantly sleepers and usually a couple of coaches on the rear. Uh, here's the Penn Central Broadway at Whiting. The track in the foreground is the connection from the former Penzi back to the New York Central. The passenger trains all came down the Penzi to Whiting and then the uh, Broadway, then the New York Central train swung back. Um, but again, still pretty look, good looking healthy train. This is uh, <clears throat> going to Chicago. This is on my first trip to Chicago in 1963. And this is Harrisburg, which actually looks a lot alike, except for the E7 and the E8 on the Manhattan Limited, which have just backed on after the GG1 left. And if you look right at the nose of the front engine, you can see Harris Tower, which has been pre um, preserved by the NRHS. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend it highly. We've moved out to the world famous Horseshoe Curve and I'm not sure which eastbound train this is. During the day, there weren't too many. It's either the Duquesne or the Juniata, a couple of uh, baggage cars and a couple of coaches. Um, and the, of course it will go, it's coming down to the, the curve and you can barely see the track at the far left. Here we are at one of my favorite places, Elizabeth, New Jersey, because obviously you had all the trains on the Penzi, including the New York and Long Branch. And then down below, you had the Jersey Central. And the Jersey Central had quite a variety of their own trains, uh, B&O trains, uh, and of course, a one-time B&O passenger trains. This is just south of Elizabeth. It is Elizabeth. You can't go here anymore. If as a regular rail fan, but uh, um, you had this this big S curve, and I don't know what train it is. My guess is looking at the number of baggage cars, and the first couple of coaches is probably an East West train, maybe the Manhattan Limited. We move back. I'm at Northwestern, and I came back um, from Chicago. I actually, I think what I did was I took the uh, Norfolk and Western to Roanoke, which you'll see later, and then came up to Washington. And then I took the Metroliner, and this is still showing the marks of the original Penn, Pennsylvania heritage with the, the red stripes, but the Penn Central logo. There's uh, two, uh, actually, Metro Club or first-class cars, which 
was kind of unusual and uh, typical Penn Central uniform. Didn't quite care for that yellow. We're back in New York and we're at Hunter's Point, which is where the, well, you had several things. On the far left, you can just see the Flushing IRT going down into the tunnel. Uh, right here, you see the tracks from Sunnyside Yard, which went down under the river and took the trains into Penn Station. So this is coming, the yard. I'm pretty sure this is the general because it always had the uh, uh, observation car in the middle of the train um, next, I believe, to the diner. Actually, the general on most railroads would have been considered a pretty good train. It was just second fiddle to the Broadway. And here is Penn Station. Unfortunately, I wish it were a little better, but um, that's the main concourse, probably 63 or so, right before the start of the destruction of the station. They had moved the, the newspaper stand, the paperback stand into the concourse where they never were, because that's where most of the people were. The other, the, the main waiting room, which really didn't have any seats, we only had the ticket windows and the information booth. Um, we're out in, uh, still on Penn Central. We're out, I think, around Wanataw. And I believe, looking at the schedules and making a best guess, this was um, uh, the Pennsylvania Limited, a far cry from its original format. Um, it was kind of interesting when you look at the Penn Central timetable. The Penzi trains still had, the East-West trains still had names, uh, but the one main East-West train in the New York Central was just numbers. Uh, we're at Porter, Indiana, and this train is coming off of uh, the Detroit line. They still come off here and uh, off the former Michigan Central line up to Kalamazoo. And the line in the foreground is the main line from New York to Chicago. We're still in the Chicago area. We're in Englewood uh, on a cold winter day. I'm guessing from this train uh, size and whatever it probably was the afternoon train to Detroit, uh, 356, which by then they had uh, no names on, on the trains, on the Detroit trains, well, any train. on the, No, there was one train on the New York Central, which still had a name, and that was the James Whitcomb Riley. Why it kept its name and everybody else lost theirs, don't ask me. In the back where that signal is, beyond there right now, is um, uh, the jump over, over uh, the Rock Island, which has been constructed by Metra. Where we move over the New York Central sign side, excuse me, this is Harmon. Uh, it's a train coming in from the west. Uh, looking at a 1966 timetable, uh, it could well be the pacemaker, which originally started as a Chicago, New York, all coach deluxe train, but by this time was uh, a Buffalo to New York train, train number two. And it will change engines here to an electric. This is a westbound train, which I think, again, guessing the time and all that, not precise, is probably the Cayuga. And we're at a place called Roa Hook, which is north of Croton Harmon. And up in the distance, you see those mountains, that's up where Bear Mountain is and the Bear Mountain Bridge, uh, uh, the highlands of the Hudson. These pictures, uh, not the greatest, this is probably from a very early camera of mine, but what you're at, Mott Haven Yard, which was the yard for uh, the New York Central in New York. This is where all the trains were serviced. It was uh, in the Bronx, north of 125th Street, um, in this sort of cut. Uh, it's no longer like this because of the tracks are a few tracks are there, but it's not used as a yard. And if he's pulling out, what he does, he pulls out, goes around a Y, and then goes up the Harlem line a short distance, and then Ys the train and shoves it in. Uh, but this, obviously, um, I think that's the Hickory Creek, so that's the 20th Century Limited. And here he goes. He's been dragged out. You see there's two slumber coaches, or excuse me, New York Central called them sleeper coaches. And next to it, at this first car, is, is the diner for the sleeper coaches and the, um, the coaches. There were probably two coaches and two. I've seen as many as four sleeper coaches. But they uh, wouldn't allow the sleeper coach people to mingle 
uh, with the first class passengers in the twin unit diner. Now we have a little bit of video here. Let's see if we can get this to work. That is the Empire State Express. And, but I believe the observation on the rear was still running to Montreal on the, rent, on the Laurentian. It was taken off the train at Albany. This is uh, University Heights Station, right near where I went to school in the Bronx. I'm disappointed it didn't go there more than I did. All right, now here we go. We don't want to do that. Well, we do maybe do it. No, it's still an RPO on the train. So this is probably 65 or 66. This is the PS de resistance. RPO, maybe another RPO. Two coaches, there's the slumbers. And here's the sleeping car section of the 20th Century Limited. It's hard to believe I could have gone down there and seen it every day. Tell you what, we'll rerun it real quick. It's not real long. I mean, the Century was the classy train right up to the end of its existence. This, I remember I said they, they it, it ended, I think, in 66 or 67. This is the successor train. Uh, again, with no name, it did have a lot of 20th century. If you look back there, you'll see a slumber coach. It used the Century's twin unit diner, but it um, combined with uh, a train by Detroit. I think it picked up a car from Toronto at Albany. It dropped Boston cars. And uh, what was it? I wrote this down here. I can't see it. No, I guess it was number 22. No, no, it was number 28, 62, 428, and 14. So it was the descendant of the 20th century. And this is uh, uh, in Indiana, right before, uh, right before Indiana Harbor. Move over to another favorite rare to mine. This is New Haven. This is a Costco bridge. Um, if you look on the right, you'll see some hoppers there. And that's coal to um, fuel the Costco power plant, which I believe was built in 1905, which provided all the power for uh, the New Haven electric trains between New Haven and New York. And this bridge was kind of unique. It was a drawbridge. Um, what the wire did, the wire went way high. The pantograph went as high as it could, but, but no higher. And then when it got to the other side of the draw section, um, it would in, engage the wire and come back down. Here's its, uh, what was supposed to replace it, the FL9, we're at Woodlawn, which is, we're still on the New York Central Harlem division, but shortly from now, the train will go up a ramp and we get to the beginning of the New York Central, I uh, mean, New Haven at SS, Tower SS20. Actually, we didn't think much of them now, but now they're a real uh, treasure. Uh, we're over on the Harlem uh, River line, the, the line, Hellgate Bridge is right behind us. And here's a train headed for Penn Station behind a New Haven EP5, or as they were nicknamed, the Jets. Uh, and because of the blowers, uh, and these two cars are collectible. Also, I believe the tracks to the left of the train was where the New York, Westchester, and Boston used to run. And Metro North is talking about starting commuter trains over the Hellgate Bridge to Penn Station. We're back out in Chicago. We're moving to the Erie Lackawanna. That's the Lake Cities at Griffith. Griffith was one of the best places to watch trains because you had the Erie, the Grand Trunk, which ran a lot of trains, the CNO of Indiana, uh, and there was a New York Central branch, didn't have much. But between just the Erie and the uh, uh, Grand Trunk, there were a lot of trains to watch. And this is the Lake Cities on its next to last westbound run. We're in Youngstown, Ohio, overnight from New York. And at the rear of the train, they're taking off the sleeper. The sleeper only ran New York to uh, Youngstown, and then it would turn around and go back on the eastbound train. 
this car probably went on the last eastbound train. It's the Tunkhannock. I think there's a Lackawanna sleeper. Um, and the diner stayed on the train at this point to marry in Ohio where it was cut off. At one point it went to Huntington, Indiana, but at this point it came off of Marion, which is where we are now. And if you look closely, you'll see the switch engine at the rear of the train taking the diner off. And I hadn't noticed until recently there's one guy here looks like he's taking a picture. Um, I don't have many good pictures, unfortunately, of the Delaware and Hudson. This was from my first trip to Canada in 1964. This is the Laurentian, and we're going up. The, the uh, lift bridge is over the St. Lawrence Seaway, and the big bridges in the distance are over the St. Lawrence River. Back to Chicago again. And this is the Capital Limited. This is at Pullman Junction, appropriately. Um, I believe all these crossings were controlled by switch tenders. It, it, it wasn't interlocked. It was, there were guys there, you know, throwing switches, raising the, the, the um, what do you call it, the gate or whatever for them to come through. And the uh, B&O always had this long roundabout route into um, Chicago. I think it took them almost an hour from Gary to downtown. And here we are at Grand Central Station, Chicago, which uh, in 1969, probably shortly thereafter, um, was... Uh, uh, closed, torn down, unfortunately not used by a lot of trains, but a pretty impressive building. And this is the Capitol with one of the B&O's unique um, low clearance dome cars. Here we are, here's the Capitol again, and you can see the clock tower with the B&O logo on it. This is untainted by the Chessie. And here we are, you know, a Capitol, um, leaving Chicago, you can see the tower and uh, the cars have started to be repainted in the CNO era uh, paint scheme. Another one, the B&O, this is the other end of the line. This is Lee Hall, uh, Virginia. Actually, it is not the B&O. I should not say it. It is the CNO. This is the CNO's main line to Newport News. Uh, and I was stationed at Fort Eustis. Virginia, and this was the closest place to watch trains. You can see that even at that late date, and I would have thought they had CTC on that line, there's still a train order uh, uh, signal there. I took advantage of uh, being in uh, Fort Eustis, and one New Year's Eve went up to, well, there was only one year, New Year's Eve I was there, went up to Roanoke, and this uh, New Year's Day, 1971, got the eastbound Pocahontas, which uh, was a pretty, pretty good looking train. I, I still can't figure out, everybody else had lost all kinds of mail. I'm not sure why they had four baggage cars on that train, but that wasn't unusual. And then here's the train east of Roanoke, could be the same day, um, with the Blue Ridge Mountains in the background. And the next picture is one of my favorites, because you can see the whole train, including the Wabash Dome on it. Uh, and the diner, and they made a deal. They had two trains. They had the uh, uh, Powhatan Arrow, which was the daytime train, and the Pocahontas was the overnight train. And they made a deal with uh, the ICC that they would put um, uh, the dome on the Pocahontas, and they would give free meals to sleeping car passengers on the Pocahontas in exchange for getting rid of the Powhatan Arrow. Well, it's a nice looking train. It could be even better with a couple of E units, but nonetheless, one of my favorite photos. This is at uh, Roanoke on another day, obviously, and um, people boarding the train towards Norfolk. The one, what you had there is you had two trains at the same time. You had the Birmingham Special, which came up actually only from Bristol, and you had the Pocahontas. And so like when I went from Chicago to New York, I would change here at Roanoke to the Birmingham Special, and people coming up from there could change to the uh, uh, Pocahontas if they were going to Norfolk or Petersburg. And here's the two trains. The um, Bir Birmingham Special ran with the Southern, probably F units. Another Fort Eustis shot. This is up at Richmond. I think this is right near um, 
AY Tower, where uh, um, Richmond Union Station is, at that time, well, the trains don't use it anymore. It's, it's a science museum, I think. But it was a very interesting design because all the trains went through in one direction. There was a big Y at one end. So you could, if you were coming from the north, you'd pull in straight. If you're coming from the south, you'd go around the Y and almost go backwards. Uh, but that's, I believe, the Silver Star. And here is Broad Street. Drains probably face, not probably, is faced at south. Uh, came down the Orphan P. I don't know what train it is. Here's an Orphan P train on the original bridge at Quantico, which was torn down, replaced by a new single track bridge, and then a new double track bridge was added back by VRE. Atlanta Coastline, this is in uh, Louisville on the south wind from Chicago to uh, Miami. The power ran through all the way from Chicago, at least on that day. And that big red brick building in the back, I think, is the l and headquarters. And if you look just to the left of the station, you can see uh, the Louisville uh, station with the tower popping up. Another picture, which was a little better, but this was on the same trip. Went over to uh, Hollywood, and this was the... Uh, uh, Silver Meteor headed south towards Miami, not too much further to go. The fl two Florida routes and the Santa Fe were probably the two most pro-passenger railroads in, uh, in the 1960s. Here's a non-straight railroad. This is the auto train. Um, I'm not sure where this is. I think this is somewhere on the RF and P. But I do know where this is. This is at Callahan which is just north of Jacksonville, which is where the line over to Baldwin, which bypasses Jacksonville um, is. And this uh, piggyback train was running ahead of the, the auto train and the auto train uh, caught him. Back to Chicago. This is what Union Station used to look like. The building in the back with the railroad names on it is still there. And you have the great concourse uh, that, is, that was preserved. Uh, but the section in the front that says Fred Harvey on it, that was torn down. And in many respects on the inside, it was, it was sort of reminiscent of Penn Station, New York. And it was, it was unfortunate it was torn down because the present part of the station is sort of like new Penn Station, low ceilings, claustrophobic. And running out of, out of, out of the station was here's the GMO, the one commuter train to J Joliet. We got an F unit, which still does run, and those uh, the tracks on the right are the St. Charles Airline and the tracks out of Dearborn Station. And at that same location, this is the L and N train that used to it used to be C and E I, and it was the Dan they called it I think the Danville Flyer. It went as far as Danville, I think that's Indiana, but I'm not sure but he's coming out of Dearborn Station. And if you look to the front of those, you can see that Santa Fe passing yard, you can see the Santa of Santa Fe. Actually, maybe you could see the, uh, if you wouldn't have these in the way. And also at Dearborn, this is the city of Decatur uh, when um, uh, the Norfolk and Western cut back the former Wabash service uh, from St. Louis, they cut it back to Decatur, Illinois. Uh, the middle car is kind of interesting. It's still painted Wabash, but it's in UP color. So it obviously used to run on the uh, city of St. Louis, which was a joint Wabash uh, Union Pacific train. Now we're over on the uh, Milwaukee Road at Itasca. And the first thing I call your attention, if you look at the nose of the locomotive, I don't think I've ever seen a diesel with a bell mounted on between the windows on the nose. Uh, a couple of people have told me there were two or three engines like that, but not many. I don't know if it was an experiment or why they did it. And this is the city of everywhere. It's the city of Los Angeles, city of San Francisco, uh, city of Portland, and may still be the city of Denver, all combined in one train. And here, as you can see, it's stretched out. It's still a lot of storage mail, which again, surprises me. 
here you got the, uh, um, I, that is probably the dome lounge. And then I think following it may be the dome diner. And then there's a dome coach back in the, uh, in the uh, train. Someone I know observed the quality of the track and the Milwaukee road was, did not look immaculate, but they still ran 80 miles an hour with this train. Here's the combined train. This is coming out of Savannah across the Mississippi River and headed for Chicago and will go up the hill, as you'll see in the next picture, uh, headed, towards, um, uh, headed towards Chicago. I haven't counted. I mean, it's, it's probably close to 20, 20 cars on this train. And here he is going up the hill. Would have been nice to have some nice sun, but we didn't. He's actually looks like he's got four domes on there. He might have one coach dome for Portland and one coach dome for LA. And this is getting near the end. The Milwaukee Road decided they couldn't stretch out their uh, uh, old D units and F units too long, so the much longer. So like a few other roads they bought, I believe these are FP45s. Um, and when the passenger service was over, they could run them in freight service. But this is at Chicago. That's the Lake Street L going to the top, but it doesn't look anything like this because there's buildings all over the track here, and this tall area, which is right down on Chicago River, has been totally changed. We're at Western Avenue, which is where the uh, Milwaukee Road coach yards were, what, probably two, three miles from Union Station, and this train, I think, is backing in to Chicago for its trip. I don't can't tell what uh, what train is, although it says 101A, which I didn't think they put train numbers in their, in their indicator things, but who knows? And this is at Techni, and that's the morning Hiawatha. The afternoon Hiawatha was gone by now, but they still ran a decent train. It's got, it, tough to see back by the bridge. They still have the big dome. And you'll see they still had, well, you can't see in this picture, they had the uh, beaver tail observation. Uh, they had a full diner up to near the end, and then they, they did some kind of cafeteria diner. But the Milwaukee Road, when they ran a train, always try to do it right. Here's the beaver tail on, that's probably the inbound morning Hiawatha, is my guess, coming down from the Twin Cities. And if you ever get a chance, the, the group in, Friends of the 261s have preserved the Cedar Rapids, which is one of these parlor obs, and what a wonderful car. It, is a, it rides better than most cars do now, and uh, um, the rotating parlor seats, it's a, it's a wonderful trip. They run it regularly from Minneapolis to Chicago. We're out of West Chicago. That's the EJ&E in the foreground. In fact, I don't know if this is, if I was here or not, but I worked one summer is the tower operator at the EJ&E Tower at West Chicago. And in fact, uh, it, when I last heard, it was still open, one of the few open interlocking towers. And this is the remains of the Kate Shelley 400. I don't think they ran it under their name, under that name. I think it only went to Dixon, if I remember correctly. And this is early, this is back in 1963. This is one of the bi-level long distance trains coming probably from either Green Bay or Ishpeming, I'm not sure, at the old Milwaukee station, which was a very impressive building down, uh, down along the lakefront. And uh, at one point they basically tore down it, tore down the Milwaukee Road station with the wonderful train shed and built a new modern station, which is, it's been refurbished. It's not too bad, but it's nothing like either of the ones that replaced. We're in that central station. I have a connection here. If you look at that building with the IC um, logo on top of it, I worked there for two or three years before we moved uptown. But uh, uh, one thing tends to forget, and I, I often forget, it, it wasn't just an IC station. You had um, the big four trains to St. Louis. You actually at one time had some of the trains to Detroit came out of here. Apparently at one point the Sioux line used it. 
Um, and am I missing anybody else? I seem, seem like I'm missing someone else, but I'm not sure. And this is the other end, it's 1963, and the, the switcher is on is spotting the Panama Limited, which still has its observation car. Uh, the cars from the New York Central are going to go probably on the James Whitcomb Riley or some other train. And the CNO sleeper down there, it was carried by the New York Central to Cincinnati, where it was put on the Sportsman. Uh, let me say the the New York Central trains to St. Louis. Uh, not St. Louis, excuse me, to Cincinnati used the IC tracks as far as Kankakee, and I believe it may have been IC train crews on board, but I'm not sure. Here we is the the fleet leader, the Panama Limited, down on the in the commuter zone. There are eight tracks there one time, four for the electric, two for the passenger, and two for the freight. I'm not sure if all eight were still there at this time. It's interesting, the trains, are, unlike most places, were almost perfectly painted. Wayne Johnson, who was the president of the IC before Alan Boyd, he insisted that his trains not be sullied with other paint schemes. And they leased a dome car from the Northern Pacific every winter for the city of Miami. And the car was painted and then repainted at the end of the season. And speaking of the city of Miami here, is the city of Miami. Uh, and you can see the dome in there, it's in icy colors. Now you got Atlantic Coastline car and a couple other cars, I can't speak for them. But this is somewhere south of Homewood out in the, the cornfields. And the other extreme is uh, the Hawkeye. This was the overnight Chicago uh, uh, to um, Sioux City train, which was uh, Jim Schaefer's, uh, Jim Schaefer? Jim Schaefer's favorite train. This is somewhere in the Western suburbs. And we have another little flick here. We think, uh, it's tough to tell, these pictures not the greatest, but I think this is the Panama Limited. This is somewhere, uh, in um, the, the observation car was gone by then, but this is that was somewhere on the south side of Chicago. All right, now we're moving on to the western roads, and this just little souvenir of the Lewis and Clark Travelers Rest on the North Coast Limited, which was, if you've never seen a very imaginatively decorated lounge, one of the best with the paintings from the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, here's the combined. Uh, North Coast Limited Empire Builder, which is long enough to stick out from under the main post office, you know, waiting to board. And it's interesting, both the Great Northern and the NP suited their onboard uh, attendants in the, these all white costumes, as you'll see here. And this is at Aurora. This is again, the combined train. And that lady is the training from the Empire Builder. Here's another great train the, at Union Avenue. This is the eastbound California Zephyr uh, with five domes, four dome coach, coach domes, I think, and one, well, I take that back. One of them may be a last, but five domes. And here he is again, though, what this is a winter, much shorter consist uh, at, I believe, LaGrange Road. And there's the OBS. And this is it in its native habitat. Uh, this is the only picture in this group that is not mine. I give that credit to Bob Johnston. And we're at Congress Park. The dome is a, a car of great interest because if you look at the windows, they're, they're flat, they're not round. This is one of the two cars that the Burlington shops created when the Burlington decided to try the concept of a dome. Uh, the, the, Popular story is that a, a General Motors vice president was riding on the Rio Grande in the cab. When he got off, he said, wouldn't it be great if passengers could see that? Now, why was the Burlington picked up on it? I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure, but the only possible train with one unit and this time of day is probably on Friday and Sunday, they ran the afternoon Twin Cities efforts to the St. Paul and Minneapolis. 
This is a sort of historic picture. Uh, in March 1970, the Burlington Northern was created. And this is the, for some reason, I played hooky from classes and uh, went down uh, to get a picture of the first uh, combined afternoon Zephyr Empire Builder and North Coast Limited. And nothing else has been painted except these two engines on the front. And there they go into the fog. This is at Dearborn Station again. This is the Grand Trunk train. I think it's probably the Maple Leaf, Chicago to uh, Toronto. I mean, when you look at it, it's, you know, compared to most trains, it, the thing is spotless. Now, I could use an E-unit, but the, the equipment, you know, you could eat off the side of the car. And here's an inbound version of the same train. Also, a real relic from the old days is that switch lamp on the right with the big high stand. Nowadays, there, if there is a switch lamp, they're all the way down on the ground. But uh, that was how they used to do it. Uh, and the Rock Island, at that time, I think they were down to two trains. I don't know if it's a Peoria train or the Quad Cities train, but coming out of LaSalle Street Station. And going over to Dearborn Station, this is the Texas Chief. The Santa Fe is always the classiest operation of anybody. Here's the high level uh, lounge car on the El Cap. Passengers are boarding. Here's the combined El Cap Super Chief was so long that uh, it, we can see the train shed of, of uh, Dearborn Station, but the combined train stuck out from under Roosevelt Road, which is above which was one of the favorite train watching spots of rail fans. And this is the Texas chief still using the F units. And this is at 21st Street crossing. The bridge on the left is uh, the bridge out of Union Station for uh, Pennsylvania at one time and, and the GMO. Here's the El Cap, uh, not the El Cap, sorry about that, Super Chief. Pleasure Dome, which I had a pleasure of riding on my honeymoon. We're now to the Union Pacific, and we're out in Kimball, Nebraska. And again, one of the two biggest trains besides the Santa Fe and this one, the city of everywhere. And the other extreme, this is the Portland Rose. The Portland Rose was the secondary train on the uh, Portland to Chicago run had a lot of mail and all, but it was at one time a decent train, you know, at sleepers and diners and all that. But by now, this is 70, 71, uh, it was down to just two coaches. And uh, it's, it's in Medicine Bow, Wyoming. On the right, is that's the Virginian Hotel, which is named after a novel, the first, what's considered the first Western novel, The Virginian, which was written by a man named Owen Wister. And the Virginian is famous for a line, which still might hear once in a while now, where um, the hero says to the villain, smile when you call me that, mister. And here's the city train at Sydney, Nebraska. I was sorry to hear that this wonderful station has been torn down. And that's the rear end. And you can see they had a steam generator car in the rear because in that cold weather, they couldn't get steam all the way through the train. And of course, it's a UP, so you can see a headlight of an oncoming train. And a little deviation in, uh, or from the, the, the narration, in 1969, it is hard to believe that it's 50 years ago, was the 100th anniversary of the Golden Spike. And I was a student at Northwestern. And I said, well, how are we going to observe this? I mean, the UP doesn't come to Chicago. Well, what we did was uh, five of us got on the city of everywhere and went to the Dome Diner, which as far as I'm concerned, is probably the finest dining car ever built, and had dinner to Savannah, which was about two and a half hours, walked across town and came back on the afternoon Zephyr. Um, and we did it. We could only get the group together on May 9th, so we were a day early. But nonetheless, we, we did observe the, the, the uh, historic event. Uh, this is at Savannah. That's the uh, Dome Lounge car. I think it's an ACF car. 
This is the up in the dome, uh, not a great picture, but, but you know, it had this sort of pink tablecloth. It had two sugar bowls. It didn't just have uh, sugar cubes, but it also had granulated sugar. And I don't mean granulated sugar in, um, in packets, in granulated sugar like you'd have in, in a bowl in your home. And, you know, it just, just, just wonderful. Uh, and you'd, you'd ride across here or say Illinois with the car swaying back and forth on the Milwaukee track. But uh, unfortunately, I only got to do it one more time. And then they took the um, dome diners out of service because they took more men to operate than a single level car. And this is in the lower level of the lounge uh, under the dome. And finally, I think on the UP, this is Rock River, Wyoming, which is west of uh, Laramie. And there's the city of everywhere, stretched out as far as the eye can see. And um, uh, US 30, the Lincoln Highway following alongside. Uh, so great, great place to see this train. All right, May 1st, 1971, all of a sudden half the trains are gone. This is what it looked like. I, you know, one point I would say, well, it looks a little sparse, but in some respects it's got stuff that, well, doesn't have too much that we don't have. The Tex this Texas train is gone, we have another. And there are some more trains in the East, but um, we lost a lot on May 1st, 71. Uh, and here's Amtrak, actually this is one of the later pictures. This is the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia and with AM7 pulling a Harrisburg train because I believe that's a Metroliner uh, car serving as a cab car in the rear of the train. And here we have nearby New Carrollton. Um, I think the train on the right is probably a long haul and the one on the left is all Amfleet. It's a corridor train. You also notice it's got the, the gauntlet track uh, for the freight trains to uh, go around the platform. Uh, of course, the gauntlet track is gone now. Whatever freight trains there are use this track on the outside. There aren't too many. Uh, an E60 designed to pull the Amfleet trains, but after multiple derailments, relegated to the 90 miles an hour and eventually sold to New Jersey Transit. This, I believe, I would guess is the Silver Star, typical with the, the, the sleepers and the diners, the heritage cars in the middle of the train, and the front end is probably the Miami section and the rear end is the St. Petersburg section. And this might be, I'm not sure, might be a, not the, literally the same train, but except I don't see a lot of, it's a, it looks like almost an all heritage train. And here we are, one of the original Metro liners, which is interesting for a couple of reasons. There's no logo on it. So obviously Amtrak took the PC logo off, but you can look at these guys working on the track. I mean, the Northeast corridor for the US is fantastic track. Well, the track the train is on is all welded rail, but the second main line, if you look at it, is all surface bent uh, uh, jointed rail, which is gonna be really rough. Then you had some more welded rail on what normally would be the freight track. And then this, this, this local track, and I don't know who used it. You talk about uh, bad rail, that's got it. But they, they were working on it and eventually uh, uh, all the tracks would be welded rail and concrete ties and much improved. These are also the original Metro liners. They were repainted so you knew who owned them. I believe this may actually be on the main line somewhere between Philadelphia and Paoli. I guess there was a period of time that the cars ran to Harrisburg after they were demoted from uh, service on the high speed trains. And here's everybody's favorite, the Pennsylvania GG1, the 4935, which was repainted by the friends of the GG1. Um, it's now in the museum at Strasbourg in it's all its glory. And here's another train with a G, but in the all black Amtrak paint scheme, um, I believe that's probably the Washington leg of the Broadway, which um, 
at this time came down the Port Road to Perryville and then got on the Northeast Car. Uh, this on the Bush River Bridge, another G with in Penn Central colors, with I would be willing to bet is the Washington section of the Broadway. And here's another G. I should know this might be at Aberdeen because there's a big curve there and a bridge in the back, which is no longer there. And this one, although the F-40 grabs your attention, if you look in the back, you'll see the German ICE train, which was demonstrating coming down past K Tower. And the other demonstrator, which was the favorite of most of the Amtrak employees and the passengers were the X-2000, the Swedish train, but they never could work out um, the financial aspects of it, unfortunately. And this is not on the card, but I'm sure you'll recognize it's an Amtrak train behind an SDP-40 on the Thomas Viaduct. There's the statue or, or tower at the, at the one end of the bridge. There obviously have been a freight derailment. Nowadays, Amtrak would just not even try. They would just give up. But it was an early in Amtrak's history, or quite a while, for the first 20 or 30 years. When something went wrong, they tried to do as good a job as they could. And here's one of Amtrak's achievements, the restoration of the Union Station, the one foggy Christmas Eve. All right, we're up in Empire Service, and there's one of the Roar Turbos, um, which were built by an aerospace company in California. And here's one with the Bear Mountain Bridge in the back. This is a favorite location for many pictures. Uh, here's another one at Breakneck Ridge which is where the aqueduct comes down and goes under the river and up, well, it comes from the, the uh, reservoir in the Catskills, goes under the river, eventually winds up in New York. It's also uh, where the Appalachian Trail comes down to cross the, uh, the Hudson River. And this shows one of the weaknesses of it. It only, train only had five cars. Now they, they did juggle around and make some of the trains six cars at the expense of others, but even six cars was not enough seats on an unreserved uh, Empire service. Here's another one. And they got as far north as uh, Montreal. And what's nice about this picture, not only do you have the turbo liner, but you have the Canadian. It was a short period where the two schedules overlapped and you had got the train side by side, plus there's a Canadian Pacific RDC on the left. This, uh, I don't know how many of you know, this is Graham Clater. This is at uh, Rensselaer Station. When construction went on down in Penn Station to construct the West Side Yard, we had an option to build a box tunnel underneath the Long Island so that the Empire Service trains could come into Penn Station instead of having two stations. And Clater insisted that they do that. And uh, if it hadn't been for him, it probably would have been done. And this is the day that they inaugurated service into uh, Penn Station. And that's a turbo liner in the back and actually an FL9 also. Moving over to the former Penzi, this is Duncannon, which is just west of Harrisburg, and that's the eastbound Broadway. We're at Harrisburg and they're splitting the train. Both, both the Washington section and the New York section have GG1s. The New York section would be the bigger of the two. I'm not sure which one has the circus GG1 and which one has the black one. This is kind of a mystery picture. I'm sure that this is the um, Washington section of the National Limited with two cars. But normally, the train came down the Port Road uh, to Perryville. And this is over near Parksburg on the Amtrak Harrisburg line. And the only thing we, I can guess is they were doing some track work or something like that, and they detoured this train via Philadelphia. At some point, they got rid of the train entirely, and you had to change trains at North Philadelphia. And in fact, in the westbound direction, they stopped a Metroliner at North Philadelphia as a connection for the westbound National Limited. The track on the left is now gone, uh, that's the Atlin and Susquehanna Penzi low grade line, which is largely a bike path. 
This is, again, I think Duncannon the other way. No, maybe this is Cove, west of Harrisburg. Uh, westbound, I think that's probably the National Limited. And here's the National Limited coming down. To be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure. Somewhere probably east of Altoona. Some, definitely somewhere east of Altoona. And there he goes. And there's another orphan train. This is the Shenandoah, which Harley Staggers insisted on. It ran on a daytime schedule, Washington, Cincinnati, opposite the Cardinal. And he wanted it because it served West Virginia. And uh, we tried a lot of marketing gimmicks, but uh, we never were successful. We're in Charlottesville and talk about short trains. That's, I believe, the Newport News section of the James Whitcomb Riley. I'm guessing the rest of the train, I'm not sure if, well, I'm not sure what. I'm not sure if the rest of the train is yet to come or the, the, the rest of the train has left, but not a real imp impressive operation. Here is at Charlottesville and the old CNO station, which is not used anymore, the uh, James Whitcomb Riley. And here is one of the Amtrak successes, the first year of the Palmetto, which was the all daylight train from New York to Savannah, which there hadn't been anything. Well, no, nothing ever made it that, that far, that fast. And um, it was a very popular train in the summer, still runs. Here's the Silver uh, Meteor at West Palm Beach. The passenger is waiting to head back to the north. And now we're at the Illinois Central or Central Station in I see in uh, Amtrak days. And there's the South Wind, which is the Chicago um, Florida train. And as you can see, it's pulled by seaboard coastline units. Here's another view of them going out there with the seaboard coastline. Um, uh, baggage dorm. Uh, the Amtrak people try to shuffle around cars, mostly from the, the good railroads, the Western railroads, to the trains from the uh, uh, Penn Central and others, which didn't have as good of equipment. This is what Central Station looked like, never a great architectural gem, but you can see they've got the Amtrak flag up and uh, Amtrak on the train bulletin. Uh, I think Amtrak only used the station from like uh, May 71 to maybe March of the following year. And here is not the Illinois Central City in New Orleans, but the Amtrak City in New Orleans, which looks an awful lot like the Illinois Central City in New Orleans, coming out of uh, Central Station going over the jump over. Here's, uh, what it was a, I think they converted at some point to the overnight train, the Panama. And I think it was still serviced initially over at the IC. So you've got this phenomenon of a brand new SD40, a beat up IC um, uh, E unit, which was probably needed for the cab signals, Amtrak rehab car pulled by a Penn Central Jeep. Uh, and it was dragged over, I believe, from uh, the, the coach yard at Central Station for a short time. And in the back, you can see the, the big red brick building is the Pennsylvania Railroad Freight House was, uh, I believe, at one time considered the largest brick building in the world. Back at Central Station, here's uh, the uh, James Whitcomb Riley. You can see it's been upgraded. It's got a, a GN dome. And it's got, uh, uh, I believe there's a Milwaukee Road Diner on there, or no, it's actually New York Central Diner, a UP coach, um, a real hodgepodge. We're back at Union Station. This is the, well, I'm not sure which one. Initially, they ran the train daily to Denver and tri-weekly to San Francisco. And I believe they didn't call it the California Zephyr, they called it the San Francisco Zephyr. This very well could be the San Francisco Zephyr. That the BN unit is not showing off very well. And if you look right over this first car, you can see the tower of Central Station. Uh, this is the north side of Union Station. 
uh, when the, the combined North Coast Hiawatha Empire Builder stopped operating via the Burlington, it went over on the Milwaukee Road to the Twin Cities. And here's what I believe is a Denver Zephyr uh, dome observation that's running on the rear of that train. One of his favorite trains for taking pictures is uh, was the combined Super Chief El Cap, still a classy train. And this is Lockport swinging around this big curve. Uh, and I think, I don't know if he's coming off of the bridge over the canal and the river or he's going onto the bridge, but nonetheless an impressive train. And here he is out somewhere west of Joliet. Uh, as you can see, Amtrak initially didn't have enough units. And it's funny, they tended to run the F units on the Texas train, but the super chief, I guess, probably the Santa Fe, insisted on it. They got, they got the, the newer units. Uh, uh, I am not sure if these were passenger units that were repainted or were freight units. The only steam, if that were the case, would be out of this one uh, FB unit there. But uh, nonetheless, that's the super chief L cap out uh, in probably Iowa or Missouri. Here's the Texas chief at Joliet, Joliet Union Station on the left, which I don't think is used anymore. Uh, kept the semaphores for a long time and had the California Zephyr observation car. Since there was no more California Zephyr. Here's the Texas uh, uh, chief climbing the hill at Edelstein, west of Chillicothe. And here's the combined train we're at Dallas, New Mexico, which is west of Albuquerque. This is where the passenger trains come down off the passenger line from Albuquerque and join the freight line, which goes south of Albuquerque through Belen. Uh, and um, uh, that becomes the, the main line. Well, it's the main line east of Belen and west of Belen, but it's a pretty impressive place to see the train. And there you go again. And this one actually is, it probably is a real train, but it's got kind of unique. If you look carefully, it's got two lounge cars, which you'll never see. Well, when we put super liners on the Super Chief El Capitan, which uh, by then wasn't called the Super Chief El Capitan, we, we had to go back. I asked the operating guys to go back to Santa Fe and ask if we could at least use the chief name. They had taken it away from us because we had uh, um, run down the service levels. And so we compromised on calling it the Southwest Chief. So we went out and we had a demonstration train in cities all over the West. And this was coming back from Los Angeles. And so we had the, the demonstration cars were in the back and the regular train was up front. This is somewhere east of Santa Fe. And this is not on the Northwestern, this is Mendota, Illinois, and that's the Illinois Zephyr, which ran to Quincy. Still does run to Quincy. We're up in uh, Columbus, Wisconsin. That's the short-lived North Coast Hiawatha. If you look in the back, by the back of the train, there's sort of a, um, uh, an oddity there. There's a wigwag crossing signal which I'm sure is not gone. But anyway, this was, was put on, and I don't know how many months it ran, but, but it ran on the former Northern Pacific uh, route in parallel to the Empire Builder. And there's actually some talk about bringing it back. There it is. I think that observation car ran on the Great Northern Internationals between Seattle and Vancouver, but I'm not totally sure. And here we are. This is the Builder at Columbus, Wisconsin. Amtrak tried the RDCs on the Blackhawk, which was the Chicago Dubuque train, and uh, which of course does not run anymore. And there's talk again about bringing it back. Here they are uh, parting the, uh, the, the mist in the middle of the winter. This is at St. Louis under the St. Louis Union Station, which is uh, the shed, which is is still there, but is no longer a train station. Though there, some few of the tracks have some cars, but it's more a mall than it is a train station. I think there's restaurants and things like that underneath there. 
But anyway, that's probably a St. Louis, Chicago trade. And here's the National Limited coming out of uh, Union Station. Now this looks on first glance like it's a uh, GMO picture, but it's not because although they're GMO units, if you look, the cars are all stainless steel. It's an Amtrak train using GMO units down somewhere north of Springfield. This is at Michigan City, uh, the drawbridge there. Um, these are the RTG turbos, even the first turbos. They were, they're basically the French design with no modifications. The RTLs were a little more streamlined and had more modifications, but they had the same problems in terms of limited size. And there were also gas guzzlers. We are at Hammond, I kept this in here for the uh, bonanza of semaphores. That's the James Whitcomb Riley coming under the drawbridge. And you can see there that rail is not of the greatest, it's all surface bent. And North Judson, which was on the Panhandle, which was the route at one time of the Floridian and the uh, Riley, and eventually they both were moved multiple times because again, the track was just, just so deteriorated and uh, uh, just kept getting worse. Penn Central didn't have the money to maintain it. It wasn't a principal freight route for them anymore. You can see appropriately a slow water sign. Crossing North Judson, I think, was the former Erie. Uh, another train, that track doesn't look as bad. Um, I'm going to guess it's the Riley rather than the Floridian. And here we are in Superior, Wisconsin, and uh, the North Star. Uh, see the grain elevators and whatever in the background. And that was, a, in case you didn't know, that was a Duluth to St. Paul train, though I think it also ran through at one point to Chicago. Now we're out in Denver, and there you can see it's the San Francisco Zephyr, not the California Zephyr. And here is pretty soon after the start of Amtrak, the train with uh, SP and Amtrak and UP units. Not looking real good. Some months later, this is the same location, actually Sacramento, I think. And there's some E units which have been, I don't know how they're good on the inside, but they look pretty sharp on the outside. Here we are, SP units. This is up on Donner Pass. They're coming out of the uh, um, uh, snowshed right near where the um, uh, top of the pass at Norton. This is the SP big dome. The SP maintained that theirs were the only domes that could possibly operate on that route. At some point, lo and behold, they discovered they could operate regular bud domes, but the train was forced to use the SP domes, which weren't as bad. I don't know if you're not familiar with the area down here, there's not a second level, so it's like from the floor up to the ceiling, and only part of it is elevated on the second level. In fact, one of these cars has been bought by the Canadian Pacific and refurbished for their executive uh, train. Here we are at Sparks, uh, the same train, but you can see the diner, former CB&Q car, run on the California Zephyr. Silver, I think, cafe. We're now up on the Empire Builder, again with a little hodgepodge there, you can see Burlington Northern, Old Northern Pacific, Big Sky Blue. I don't think, the only thing we're missing is the original uh, uh, Northern Pacific um, color scheme. But it's a pretty impressive train. It's got four domes. There it goes. Actually, this car is unique. This is, this is uh, in Burlington Northern Green. And here we are up coming down from the summit at uh, Glacier Park, the eastbound Empire Builder. And here are passengers waiting to get on the builder in the original GN Depot. It's a wonderful place to stay. You just to the right behind the station, if you've never been there, is Glacier Park Lodge. And you just walk a hundred feet or so and you're right in the lodge, which is an impressive building itself. And here we are, we've, we've crossed the bridge uh, and the mountains are in the back. 
and here's the train in the earlier years at Cutbank, uh, Montana, and you can see in the distance, if you look carefully on the horizon, you can still see the Rockies poking up. It's about 50 miles or so further west. This is the north coast Hiawatha, and I should have looked up what river it is, but uh, actually most people thought the north coast Hiawatha was a more scenic route. And here we are on, this is the north coast Hiawatha, not a, not a bad looking train. I should know what town it is, but I don't. And here's again, the north coast Hiawatha, and I should know that name and I don't. All right, well, even after May 1st, 71, there were still other trains out there. They just weren't pointed arrow. So we have a small potpourri of them. Here's, this is the departure board at Denver for the Rio Grande Zephyr. Looking pretty nice, silver sky at Denver. Here he is coming up the uh, east slope of the mountains, uh, up past the big six curve in the pass and headed for the Moffat Tunnel. There he is climbing up there. I wish the shot were a little better. This is, I believe, Gore Canyon. This is out in the Wasatch, out near Provo. Not quite to Provo, probably. And here's another picture on the West End. And here's the Rio Grande Station in Salt Lake, which is still there. I forget what everything using. I know one end of it is a uh, Mexican restaurant. And kind of a sad reminder of what was, if you look at the sign hanging over the train. And here's the Rock Island, which hang on, hang on with the two trains. One of them at least had a private parlor car on it, the Big Ben. But like many of the other pictures we had, the track was definitely suffering. Here he is, I think this may be a bureau, and there's the private parlor car on the rear. We're down in New Orleans. Graham Clater wasn't going to join Amtrak, and uh, but the trains he was going to run, he was going to run top notch. And these are this is the Southern Crescent getting ready uh, to leave New Orleans in the morning. And finally, most people don't think about this. Is Alaska. This is up 1979 on Turn Again Arm. I got to go up there on a business trip. The the general manager wanted Amtrak to take over the passenger service. Fortunately, we didn't because it wouldn't be nearly as good as now. But uh, this is from another trip at Anchorage. And that's going across the famous Hurricane Gulch um, Bridge, which you don't get as how high it is because of the view. But um, they still had some former UP dome cars. I think they may still have some running. But they, this was before the era of the, uh, all the double-decker cars. And here we are at Denali Park, the original station, which has been torn down uh, and it's sort of a Spartan, but modern facility there. And this was in 79, we, we rode, as I said, on this business trip up to Anchorage and back on the mixed train in the office car. But that was a great shot to the Anchorage re getting ready to go. And I think this is up near Hurricane, maybe near Hurricane Gulch, they had a, procedure. They didn't have hot box detectors, so they, they, the crew would get off, they'd pull the train by and you'd inspect it, and then they'd back up again. So I'd get a picture. And last but not least, up along the shoreline east of Brantford, there's the Acela, which is soon to be historic, but looks pretty good in there. And um, uh, achievement of Amtrak, the electrification east of New Haven. And uh, who knows what will come in the future. And now turn this over to Scarlett, I guess. Wow, Ira, <laughs> that's fantastic. I feel like uh, you have added to the historical record tonight. And There's lots of people out there probably could do this as well as me. Yeah, but we've got it all together and we've got your commentary and it is much appreciated. Yeah, a few things. I don't think anyone was with Alan Boyd on April 30th, 1971. Um, so we have kept our audience, and that is a testament to the fantastic nature of the program. So I will thank you one more time, and I also want to thank um, the folks that are behind the scenes who made this happen tonight, and Mason and Darren Goldsmith, uh, as always. Uh, if you've missed our programs in the past, 
You can find them on the chapter's YouTube channel. This is just an example of some of the programs and um, all well worth watching at least once, sometimes twice. Uh, and I believe that brings us to the end of our program. If, if so, anybody has a desperate question has to be answered, they think <laughs> I can, you can email me at M-A-R-C, Mark, Rail, R-A-I-L, one, at gmail.com. No abusive questions, just questions. That is very generous of you, Ira. Uh, again, we thank you so much for uh, your program tonight, and we bid you all good evening. <laughs>